Due to the great content, great amount of content that I'm going to be sharing on the theme I want to preach on tonight, uh, I don't think you will begrudge me if I skip the commentary on the gospel. There's some interesting things the fathers have to say, but none of them are earth-shattering, and so I think you might appreciate it if I go straight into the material I'm going to be preaching on. And what I'm going to be preaching on might seem strange, might seem that I'm missing an opportunity to talk about spiritual preparedness, but what I am going to be talking about is something that makes us different from unbelievers and is leading and will lead to further persecution as described in today's gospel. And the thing that I want to speak about is feelings. Yes, I assure you I have them. But I want to speak about feelings and how we deal with them as Christians, um, especially in light of our, uh, of, well, in light of many things. In the grand scheme of things, as Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen observed, we live in a sensate age. We, no long, we are no longer governed by faith, we are no longer governed by reason, we are governed by feelings. And while it's certainly been the case since the fall, that dealing with our feelings is difficult because it's part of the disorder caused by Adam's sin. We no longer live in a Christian society which helps us deal with it, and we are now seeing the full fruit of this rotten seed in our society. So, let's start with uh, a distinction. Distinctions are always important. Our feelings uh, are both a spiritual and a psychological topic, but I want to make a distinction here on our use of the word feeling, at least in English. I don't think it had, you have the same problem in Spanish, but in English, we often say, I feel about something, and sometimes we actually mean a feeling, a sentiment, and that's a very common use of that word, but sometimes we mean that we have a position and we know that we've arrived at that position based off of experience or things that we know. But we can't articulate it or we don't exactly know why we got there. And we call that a feeling, but that's really called intuition. It's really thinking, but you just don't know how you got there. It's more subtle than that. So there is a distinction there. Uh, I do encourage people to stop using feelings, and that's the word feeling in that sense so we're very clear. You don't feel that something is right or wrong. You know something is right or wrong you can think something is right or wrong. You also have feelings, but that's not how we make moral decisions, among other things as well, right? So we want to clear up our language on that. So there is that use of the word, but we need to be clear that sometimes what we really mean is think. Now, this is both a spiritual and a psychological topic, and I'm actually going to speak a little bit more on the psychological side, but obviously we need to look at this from the spiritual side as well. Feelings certainly have their place in the spiritual life, but like many things, they can be misunderstood and abused. As a general rule, emphasis on the word general, feelings follow, they do not lead in the spiritual life. What I mean is, there may be a feeling as a result of something spiritual, but we should not be evaluating or making spiritual decisions as a general rule based on how we feel. And the reason for this is very simple. On one side, God can, and often does, to purify us, remove good feelings from spiritual activities and uh, spiritual exercises in order to help us grow, to keep going this way without reward. And sometimes the devil can induce good feelings about things in order to trick us. And so they're not really reliable. Spiritually mature people, usually with the help of a director, can navigate it. But as, again, a general rule for most people, I recommend a good, healthy skepticism of spiritual feelings. St. Ignatius of Loyola and his spiritual exercises does a lot of work on this. That's a good thing to look at as well. Now, let's look at this psychologically and, of course, also spiritually. Emotional maturity is not the same thing as physical growth. One of the sayings that I heard years ago, which I find to be more and more true the longer I live, 
is that wisdom does not always come with age. Sometimes age just comes by itself. And it's the same thing with our emotions. Our emotional age and our intellectual age, etc., is not always the same as our physical age. What do I mean by emotional maturity? Well, it includes many factors, and again, to, to spare you, I'm only going to name a few of them so you kind of get an idea. It involves, for example, managing your feelings. It involves a healthy handling of stress. It involves empathy and self-disclosure, self-acceptance, and personal responsibility. Most adults are actually emotionally immature, at least in some way. And my experience bears this out. To speak in general terms, most adults are actually still like children or adolescents who have merely learned how to control their reactions so that they are not punished for their behavior by peers, employers, their wives, or the law. And then just a couple of examples to what I mean by that. The best example is the symptom uh, of this symptom is bad customers in stores and restaurants called Karens colloquially. People who treat the, the staff horribly because employees are obliged to treat the customers if they're always right, and everyone else is spineless and will not correct a fellow customer for treating the staff badly. Another good example is traffic laws. No cop, no stop. Or perhaps uh, in the approach of many modern uh, Western Catholics in their approach to parishes uh, regarding the sacred liturgy. Instead of coming to offer adoration uh, selflessly to God, they are more interested in how they feel based off of the sermon and the music. Um, but that's what, again, as long as no one is there, no one stands up to them, no one corrects them, they don't have any negative response, they continue their behavior. And it's very, very immature. Something that I will be quiet before I fall into sin. So, the reason that I know many people need to deal better with their feelings is because of the drug abuse that I'm aware of through my pastoral uh, counseling and Confessions. But I want to use two definitions of drugs. One is the one that you're probably thinking, and that is a chemical substance that's introduced into the body to feel better, usually to avoid physical or emotional pain. That's kind of a general understood definition. But I think that for spiritual purposes, we can also define a drug as any choice or activity which we do for the sake of emotional or physical pleasure in order to avoid emotional or physical pain. And again, my concern here is how common I, this is. How many people operate this way tells me that they do not have the emotional maturity to deal with their feelings, and therefore they are turning to drugs. Again, not necessarily fentanyl, but these other things in this second definition. What, does, what are some examples? I'll go through a number of these. Impure images and videos, and then six commandment sins by themselves or with other people. I'm keeping this rated G. You should know what the sixth commandment is. Okay? Uh, and if you don't know what the examples are, then I'm not going to teach you. Uh, other very serious examples are the pharmaceuticals, which I just talked about, actual chemicals being used. These are some of the more gravely sinful. But you can also see this in likes on social media, sorry, likes and followers. We've got people and subscribers, right? Um, alcohol, and I have to add the caveat here, because too many uh, women tell everyone that they're not allowed, to, that no one's allowed to drink just because some people don't know how to control themselves. Alcohol is not the problem. It's the abuse of alcohol that's the problem. Any problems with that, come to me. I can referee that. Food is a huge one. Food is a huge problem. Praise, attention from others, adrenaline-inducing activities or media, scary movies or action movies kind of thing, and even 
no elbowing, husbands please. Shopping can be used this way. Uh, but people can do other everyday activities as well. Working out, there's a young man who came to me after the noon mass asking me to clarify, which I greatly appreciated, and I ask all of you to do the same thing. There's a lot of material and everyone's different, but I, I need to get it out there so we can start talking about it. But he has some questions for me, he clarified it, and it was very good. But working out, shooting, fishing, any other recreation that people do can also be, uh, if done inordinately, can be used as a drug. Even prayer can be a flight from pain. And I don't just simply mean in the sense that we should turn all our pain over to the Lord. I mean an actual escape instead of dealing with it. Now, obviously, not all of these things need to be stopped. Like, you know, the young man does not need to stop working out. But he needs to understand that it should not be as at the expense of dealing with his feelings. We have to be careful, conscious of how we use these things. And so the bulk of what I want to say tonight has to do with dealing with our emotions as Christians. Beginning with the very important fact, everyone listening, you have not been yet, emotions are not evil. They are part of who we are, part of who we were created by God, and like all things, they've been distorted by sin. So feelings are not sins. Don't come to me in confession and say that you felt angry. Jesus felt angry. What you need to say is, I got angry and hit my brother. Now, there's the sin, right? That's the distinction. Feelings are not sins. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. It's our actions, our deliberate choices that can be sinful, whether they're expressed externally or keep them inside. Certain feelings can reveal the state of our souls, of course, but the point is, is that children need to be taught that feelings are not bad, but they need to control how they express them. And some children need to be taught more than others. But... For those who need to grow in this area, there are four simple but difficult rules that I want to share today. The first is, do not suppress your feelings. Even if a particular feeling has the potential to lead you to sin, because it's only when you choose to sin that you've committed the sin. The feeling itself is not a sin. Suppression means that you are not allowing yourself to feel it at all, forcing it away. An example of this, which is very common, I'm just experiencing it uh, in recent uh, work with people in the parish, is when people are taught that, uh, especially boys, that you can never cry publicly, if ever, or just in general, that you need to suck it up and move on. That has caused so much emotional damage to so many people, and they don't recognize it. There is, of course, a difference between suppre suppressing your feelings and waiting to deal with them. You can't just simply stop every time you have a strong feeling in the middle of what you're doing to deal with it. But there's a difference between waiting and simply suppressing it so you don't feel it at all. They need to be expressed and dealt with, but maybe not in the moment. But if you don't ever do it, then they will fester. Again, there's a difference between feeling and the sinful act of the will. Because feelings are not sinful, it is not necessary to suppress feelings in order to avoid sin. When you suppress feelings, they eventually come out in other ways, always unhealthy and usually sinful. Uh, most people, including the elderly, have not learned how to do this. And a good test for you is to simply, no matter what your age is, is to try and sit for five minutes in silence. Now, some people have gotten to the point where they like that. But most people can't. And when I say silence, I mean no phones, no cheating, okay? They can't sit with themselves, they can't sit with their feelings, and therefore they have to turn to these drugs. And again, I'm using the general use of the word drugs. The most common one being, of course, these days, phones. Now, it occurs to me that I've never actually explained this. I explained this to one of the young girls in the parish a couple of weeks ago, and she actually seemed to finally click at least a little bit of what I mean. Because I'm always telling you, get rid of the drug, put the drug away. And people are probably like, all right, Father, whatever. I don't mean it poetically. I'm not being overly dramatic. I don't know the, bio the, the biological vocabulary.
vocabulary off the top of my head, and quite frankly, it's not that important. You can go look it up if you'd like. But the fact is, is that the use of screens, and even worse, when you have things like achievements and games or other uh, positive feedback, stimulates your brain to produce chemicals which feel good. They're drugs. And if you keep looking for that stimulation, you get addicted. Most people are addicted to their phones. Who have them. Not everybody, you don't, you don't have to say, Father, I'm not. Okay, fine, we'll figure out what you are addicted to. The point is that most people uh, who commonly use their phones are somehow addicted to it. So I'm not just being dramatic, it's very clear. And we need to avoid that. So rule number one, do not suppress the feelings. And by, by that, that includes not avoiding them by using one of these drugs. Step, step number two, do not left brain your feelings or the feelings of others. The brain is, and I'm speaking generally again, uh, right side is more creative, artistic, left side is more rational, logical, right? So when I say to left brain something, I mean don't process things purely logically and reasonably, although that's ideal, but if you have not integrated your feelings properly and not learned to deal with them, that is a way of suppressing them. That's a way of ignoring them. And again, that leads to disaster. Your initial response to the feeling should not be to give you yourself reasons why you shouldn't feel that way. And this again, this advice is primarily intended for those who have not learned to deal with their feelings properly who need to still grow and heal. Certainly for those who are more and more emotionally mature, you may left brain, but this requires self-knowledge. Simply put though, again, generally speaking, most people need to be careful with left braining their feelings, saying why you shouldn't feel that way. Number three, do not sin. No matter what the feeling is, and again, no feeling as a feeling is evil, do not let it lead you to act internally, verbally, or physically, or refuse to act in a way that might be sinful. So do not suppress the feelings, do not let brain your feelings, do not sin, but after having allowed the feeling to subside and to feel it, at least for the most part, then you can go back and process it with the left brain, with all those to understand it and to react to it more reasonably, but first you have to let it be. How long that takes depends on how old you are, how much experience you have, etc. How far along in the feel healing process you are. But it's something that we have to make time and to even use our prayer time for. If we offer ourselves completely to the Lord, that includes our feelings. Now, what does that look like in practice? I want to use uh, pride and anger as simple examples. You can substitute many others, any others, all right? Let yourself, step one, don't suppress it. Let yourself be angry or feel proud. Don't push the feeling away. Experience that warmth in your chest or whatever part of the body you've got that biological reaction to. Take your time, let it dissipate on its own. Don't override it, don't bury it, don't try and push it down so that you don't feel it. And this step is difficult when you are busy. If you have to put it off till later in the day, that's fine. Don't put it off until the next day. This is also really important uh, just to note on any, anything sexually related. Obviously, deliberately entertained thoughts uh, and actions are, of course, gravely sinful, but not the feelings necessarily themselves. And this is particularly true for anyone who is struggling with things like same-sex attraction or transgenderism or whatever else it is. That has to be dealt with properly um, or it it goes very bad. So, number one, you don't suppress the feeling. Number two, you are not to left brain. So, do not immediately respond to that feeling of pride or your anger with all those phrases that you've been taught. You have no right to be angry. Or, you are nothing without God. What do you have to be proud of? Those are absolutely true and absolutely not helpful as an initial reaction. In other words, a reaction that tries to suppress it. So ignore these words until you've allowed yourself to, to feel the feeling and integrate it. 
Always allow yourselves to keep feeling whatever, again, that burning sensation or that, or if it's pride, that swelling, whatever it is that you're feeling, even biologically, allow yourself to keep feeling that as long as you don't go into sin. And then, of course, don't sin. While you should not think things that try to suppress your feelings, like ignoring or suppressing your pride by saying, what do you have to be proud of? Neither should you, of course, think, say, or do things which are sinful because of the feelings. So in other words, wishing ill on the person that made you mad, planning to take revenge on them, or telling yourself how great you are for whatever you're feeling proud about, those would be sins, and that would not be a proper way uh, to deal with the feelings. But the feelings are not sinful. Now, after you've gone through these steps and given it time and allowed yourself to properly feel the feelings, then later, especially in prayer, you can go back and talk to yourself the way you were doing in number two. And these steps really should be practiced in prayer. God wants us to offer everything to him and to hold nothing back. And there's no better way to deal with your emotions than in prayer. So when we're angry, and there are reasons to, legitimate reasons to be angry, we can pray for our persecutors without suppressing the feeling of anger. When we're proud, we can pray for humility without suppressing the feeling of humility. When we're sad, we can seek consolation from the Lord without suppressing the sadness. And we can even meditate more fruitfully on these times when our blessed Lord exhibited those same emotions by uniting our emotions to his. And then prayer becomes much more personal and fruitful. Again, this topic may seem strange, and I certainly encourage you, if this seems helpful, or if you feel that there's something uh, wrong and based off of what I've said that you need about yourself, you need to work with or figure out, please feel free to talk to me about this, because again, I'm giving a, a shotgun to the entire congregation, and everyone has to deal with these things differently. But I do know that this was necessary because of the experience I've had with many of you and how helpful this has been for some of the people that I've already shared it with individually. So I do know it's necessary, but each individual has to work on it on their own. It's also uh, important and it's timely uh, in light of next week's celebration of the universal kingship of Jesus Christ. Because for each one of us, we will either be a slave to our passions and our feelings, that is, to ourselves, and therefore the devil, or we will submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. There's no third option. 